I have thoroughly enjoyed our words from the choir and our praises as we sung about how much God has done for us. Amen? Try to reflect back for a moment what it was like before we knew Christ, before Jesus even came. Humanity was in a hopeless state, sinful, inherited sin and chosen sin, separated from God, facing an empty existence and a Christless eternity. But God, the God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, as a sinless lamb of God to take on human flesh, to be mocked and brutally beaten, to be punished and to die for the sins of all of humanity, including yours and mine. Amen? That whoever then believes in him, whoever believes in what he did for them on that cross, Whoever comes before that cross and kneels before that cross, whoever then confesses their sins and asks Jesus to die and cleanse them from their sins as their sacrifice, and then they, they ask Jesus to come into their heart and life as their Savior and vow to follow and honor Jesus with their lives, they shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen? Amen. We do not deserve such love from God. We do not deserve such sacrifice from Jesus. We cannot earn it or buy it or achieve it. We cannot gain this gift from God on our own. It's called grace. We think we know grace, we understand grace, but until you fathom all that happened to us because of God's loving us first, we can't totally understand it. Wonderful, beautiful, amazing grace, a beautiful gift from a beautiful and loving God. And with grace comes God's forgiveness and cleansing of our sins. With grace comes being reborn now as children of God. With grace comes in an indwelling of Christ within us as our constant everyday friend. And with grace comes the security of heaven with Jesus as our eternal home when we leave this earth. And all because, but God so loved. Because of God's love while we were yet sinners, and we rejoice in this so much. Somebody has taken the letters of grace and they've made it into this kind of a saying. Grace means, say it with me, God's riches at Christ's expense. Wow. Wow. There's that hymn, The Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord, that says this, Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of Jesus was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Did you hear that? Grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace that is greater than all our sin. We're in a little sermon series about grace, greater grace. And our symbol has been what it is here. God's grace is greater than, name it, anything, any sin, any transgression. Any sadness in our lives, God's grace is greater. Whatever you put in that blank, God's grace toward you and for you is greater than that. Last week, Pastor Eddie shared about this, how he talked about Peter being restored. Peter, who had denied his Lord, and Jesus meets him on that shore cooking some fish and restores Peter back because God's grace is is greater than any of our sins and failures. Fill in the blank in your own head. Whatever sins, whatever failures, whatever secrets, whatever regrets you carry, God's grace is greater than anything you could write in that blank. How does that make you feel? 
But the one thing about grace, you can hear about it, you can read about it, you can even explain it, but until you experience it, you just can't get it. I remember when I was performing a wedding with another pastor, they were going to sing in that church. It was their church, so I was kind of assisting him. They were going to have sung Amazing Grace, and as the soloist warmed up, they sang these words. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that came and set me free. I said to the pastor after, I said, isn't the verse supposed to be Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me? He said, yes, but we don't want anybody around here feeling like a wretch. I said, but that's the point. We are wretches. And that's the amazing grace. As he saved a wretch like me. Oh, such amazing grace, once you realize it, should change you. It should, it should cause you to lift your heart up and worship and thank God for it. If you're a Christian, it impacts the core of who you are. It, it makes all the difference in your heart and your life. And we celebrate that grace every time we meet together as a church. And as Christians, we have all experienced the same amazing grace. Amen? It's like we all have been sentenced to a death sentence and then we have the judge have his son die in our place and we are set free. It's like we've all been diagnosed with a terminal illness and, and the great physician informs us, I've given you a cure. It's like we've all accumulated a huge debt that we cannot possibly pay and then we're informed that the one that we owe the debt to has forgiven the debt. Of course we're going to celebrate that. Of course we're going to be joyful and we should be. And today we're going to flip the grace point over. We love to be on the receiving side of grace. We love to talk about that and we love to rejoice in that. And, and when we, but when we talk about giving grace, sometimes we find it more difficult. If God's grace is greater than anything we have done, is our grace toward others also greater than anything they have done to us? If God's grace is greater than anything we have done, is our grace toward others then so also greater than anything they have done to us? Grace is a beautiful concept as long as you're not talking about somebody who's hurt you, an abusive parent, a spouse, a mean sibling, a former boss, a backstabbing coworker, a former so-called friend, those crazy other drivers, and even some fellow church members. Proverbs 14.10 says, each heart knows its own bitterness. I mean, all of us have been hurt and we all carry around hurts and Maybe from years ago, some hurt sins committed against us. So when it comes to grace being greater than such as these, things get difficult. In today's scripture passage of Matthew 18, we, we find a powerful parable spoken by Jesus. And in it, he challenges our spiritual socks off. And we learn that grace is only grace if it goes both ways. Biblical grace, like that which comes from God, if you only receive it and rejoice in it, but you do not give such grace to others, then you have short-circuited all of what God wants such grace to be. The extent to which we are willing to give grace reveals the extent to which we really understand grace. The litmus test for whether you are really understanding and appreciating God's grace is a relationship and how you give grace to others. Even the one who has hurt you the most and deserves the least. When someone who has really hurt you comes to you seeking such forgiveness and grace, and again, they have really, really hurt you, the real test of your maturity and grace and understanding of grace and all that you have gained through God's grace is shown in how you respond to them. In our passage for today, we find Peter coming to Jesus, and it's not surprising with Peter, he approaches Jesus with a loaded question. A question that Peter probably already has in his mind, 
how he wants it answered or he knows the answer for. It says in verse 21, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? The NIV, New International Version says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? It kind of sets it up as a, as a math problem. Does seven times qualify as greater than grace? If you know Peter, he's being pretty gracious here. In fact, the Jewish rabbis taught that you had to forgive someone three times, and after that, you didn't have to forgive them. But Peter more than doubles that number and proudly presents seven times. He's feeling pretty sure of himself that he's going to get a compliment from Jesus. He's probably expecting Jesus to say, Peter, seven times? Why? Can't all the disciples be like you? He's thinking that's what's going to happen. He's throwing out a number that seems so gracious. We're not sure. Maybe even Peter is thinking of a personal person in his life. Maybe someone who has heard him not once, not twice, but exactly seven times. And now he wants to hear the end so he can strike back. And maybe you've been hurt by someone. Maybe someone close to you. Because nothing hurts more than being hurt by someone very close to you. Because when we are close to people, we give them our hearts. And when we give our hearts, they have power over us. And that power can be used against us with damage and hurt. I don't know the name of a, a person it may have been for Peter. Or the name it may be for you. So we'd kind of like to ask the question of Jesus also. We'd like to know that answer. How far... Is too far, Lord. How much is too much? When does grace run out? In other words, Peter is asking Jesus, when instead of grace being greater than hurt, does a symbol flip to hurt as being greater than grace? And Jesus answered in verse 22. Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. His answer is not saying just count up to like 490 times and then pow, punch him in the nose. No, Jesus is using that seven again, like Peter did, as a biblical number of completion, saying not seven times or 490 times, for grace is never less than. Grace is always greater than. As a Christian, we know it is truth because Jesus said it, but emotionally, it's kind of difficult to grasp. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel true. So Jesus gives Peter and, and us a parable to help us understand and get our arms around this truth that grace is greater than any blank. As he begins in Matthew 18, Jesus starts telling about the, this powerful king, kind of a powerful CEO type who is looking at his accounting books and settling accounts and it's time for him to start collecting and he sees this one slave of his that owes a tremendous amount. It says, for this reason, in 23 to 24, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who set, wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who had owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, we have to understand, that's a lot of money even for that day. 10,000 talents, some variations say, interpretations, 10,000 bags of gold, were estimated that to be about $150 million. Now, I know we all have run up our credit cards. How many have run up $150 million? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Anybody from Congress? Never mind. Here. That was a 10 times the national budget of the day. Astronomical number the point was that Jesus was making, this is a debt that this man could never repay. That's why he gave the number. And verse 25 says, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. In that world, it was not unusual to have that kind of punishment for someone who owed but could not pay. They were sold into slavery. Their spouse and children were sold into slavery. Everything they had was sold into slavery. Everything they owned was sold. And they'd take what they could out of it. So that's what this king was planning. 
to sell the man, his family, and belongings to get what he could from it to clear his books. Now, the parable is here to remind us that this is the state that we all stand before God. We all have sinned, and that sin has racked up a debt that we could never repay. We can ignore the debt, that it's not there. We can try to forget it, try to reason that our debt, our sin, isn't as great as others. We can reason that maybe if I do enough good things, I can cancel out the debt. But the truth is, none of us, no human being, can ever escape the great debt of sin that we owe before a holy and righteous God. So Matthew 18 begins with this reminder that we all owe this huge of a debt The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says if you've broken one commandment, you're guilty of breaking them all. And there's no sense in denying it because God knows. He knows it all. He knows all of our sins. You may have heard my wife, Deb, share a little bit about her testimony that growing up, she was told that for every wrong thing she did, she got a big red dot in a book in heaven. And for every good thing she did, she got a gold star. But if she got a red dot for the same wrongdoing, she couldn't get rid of it. Because if you did it again, you obviously weren't really sorry. So God wouldn't forgive you again, and the big red dot remained. And she grew up thinking, I have so many red dots. And I don't have enough stars to cover them. And last week, as you know, she was under the weather, so she watched online. And Pastor Eddie said these words, If you ask God to forgive you for the same thing for the 50th time, will he forgive you? Yes. And she yelled, she said, nobody else was there. Amen! She appreciated that reminder, Pastor Eddie. God knows it all. What happens in Las Vegas does not stay in Las Vegas. God has it logged in. What happens in secret in the dark between two consenting adults? If it's sin, God knows. He knows it all. He has it all logged in. There was a university that had a it was final exam week, and since multiple teachers taught the same course, they decided to fill the one auditorium with all the same with students from the different classes, but have one moderator. And one of the professors drew the short straw, so he had to be there for the moderate the test, and he said, "Okay." He said, your test papers are down on your desk. Your pencils are down on your desk. You have one hour to complete this test. He said, I will tell you every 15 minutes how much time is remaining. At the end of the hour, you must put your pencil down, come up, and stack your papers up here on my desk. You only have one hour. I'll accept no papers after the hour. You may begin. 15 minutes went by. He said, okay, 15 minutes have lapsed. You have 45 minutes. Another 15 went by. He says, okay, 30 minutes have lapsed. You have 30 minutes. 45 minutes have gone by. All right, you only have 15 minutes left. Please try to start finishing up. 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 1 minute. Then pencils have to go down. Okay, time's up. Please come up. And everybody shuffled and was getting their things and coming down and they're stacking them up on his desk. And he noticed one fellow in the back was still writing. He said, sir, back in the back, I see you back there. Please put your pencil down. If you keep writing, I will not accept your paper. Please put the pencil down. You have to listen to the instructions. He just kept writing. Sir, put that pencil down right now or I will not accept your paper. Just kept writing. He said, well, I just won't accept his paper. So everybody's gone. Fellow finally puts his pencil in his pocket, comes bouncing down the the steps and he hands his paper and the professor says, I'm not going to accept your paper. He said, what do you mean? He said, I told you, I repeatedly warned you, I will not accept that paper. He looked at the professor, he said, do you have any idea who I am? He said, no. He said, good. Lifted the middle of the stack, put us in the middle and walked out. (laughs) Ah, but God, who knew that student was? (laughs) He knows our cheating. He knows our flirting. He knows the on-life surfing. He knows the cursing. He knows the yelling. He knows the abusing. He even knows about the pride that some of us might be feeling right now that I didn't list your sin in that group. Nothing in creation is hidden from his eyes. We all have a huge debt 
that we can never escape our payback. It says in verse 26, So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Well, no, he won't. It's ridiculous. There's no way for him to pay back his debt. There's no way for him to make this right. There's nothing he can do to balance those books. And Jesus uses this astronomical number to make the point that repayment is not an option. This man has no chance of it. But verse 27 says, And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him, forgave him that debt. $150 $150 million. Just cancels the debt. Let's him go. That's an incredible act of grace. He doesn't extend the note. He doesn't adjust the payments. He cancels it, erases it, and lets him go. Wow. Everybody breathe a collective sigh of relief. Ah. <sighs> And then the story takes a disturbing twist. Verse 28, But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Okay, this is like 20 bucks. He owed him $20. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Okay, this guy's just been forgiven $150 million and he refuses to give $20 worth of forgiveness and grabs him by the throat and demands to be paid back. And 29 says, his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. The exact quote from this guy is the exact quote that this guy gave before the king. And he's asking for the same grace that he had received, but to a much lesser degree. Now, if you've never heard this story before, what would you have thought was going to happen? Of course he's going to forgive him. Of course he has been, just been shown such great mercy, so he will show mercy in this smaller debt as well. Of course he will. Because he understands what it means to be released. But verse 30 says, but he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. Now, verse 31 that follows is often overlooked, but there's a strong, strong meaning here. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. They all, the servant who had been forgiven the $150 million, the servant who owed $20, and all the other servants, they all served under the same king, who we see turned out to be a kind and benevolent king, And when they see someone act as this servant was acting, with that kind of grace he had been extended, they were outraged. So much so that they reported it to the king. It's a normal response to see someone receive such extravagant grace and then not offer it to someone else. I was in a church setting one time where I was working with a group of church leaders and out of the group, two of them, came to me separately with some personal issues they were personally struggling with. And I counseled with them for months and walked them through their issues and prayed with them and held them accountable. And in total confidence, they found victory over these issues. No one but each of them and I knew to this day know what those issues were. About six months after that, A person in the church was having some struggles and he came to the leaders for some guidance and they heard him out and then he left. And all the leaders wanted to love him and counsel him and walk this brother through his struggle. All the leaders, uh, correction, all the leaders but two. Yep, the two that just a few months earlier had been loved and counseled and walked with. Now they, in their self-righteousness, wanted basically to cast the brother out. And he was seeking forgiveness and direction. I just looked at them. Could not believe what I was hearing from them. 
You would think that these two brothers who had been so loved and counseled and encouraged would have learned some compassion and grace from it, but they hadn't. And I wasn't going to violate the confidentiality, although I could have really made a nice lesson out of it, but I, my integrity won't let me. So I could not say a word. I said things privately to them later, but they were staunch. So we assisted the brother without them. As far as I know, that brother has also found victory in serving the Lord in many ways as well. I believe the reason that Jesus had this scene of the outraged servants in this story is so we, realizing how much we have all been loved and forgiven, if we see others in the church family being unforgiving or non-grace-giving or judgmental, we need to be disturbed by that. We need to be disturbed that, that our fellowship operates in a different way. We need to be, in a way, outraged that we as a church will not be okay with ungrace. It's not okay if some of our own are condemning, judging, or gossiping about someone else who comes in because they're different or they struggle with things or they're a mess. Because they are us. We all have sinned. We all have come in here as messes. And we so often forget that. We all need God's grace and there is none righteous, no, not one. No one deserves God's grace. It continues in verses 32 to 34. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. Well, paying back that debt is going to last a long time. How long do you think in prison it would take a person to earn $150 million? A long time, like forever? It's not going to happen. He's never going to pay it back. He's going to spend the rest of his existence in prison. And then Jesus ends his parable with a punch point. Verse 35. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. He brought it around to the first question, how many times should I forgive someone? I know some of you might be pushing back right now. You're telling me if I don't offer forgiveness to those who hurt me, then God will hold me accountable. No, I'm not telling you that. Look what Jesus is telling us, though. So my heavenly Father will also do to each one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Yes, others have hurt you. They have hurt you deeply, and you're supposed to offer forgiveness to them? It's not fair. It's just not fair. You want to look at fair? Look at this. $150 million compared to 20. And he didn't offer grace. Which is more fair? What have you been forgiven for by God? The grace given for your sins will always be greater than anything you have to forgive others for. The more you realize how much grace God has given you, the more grace you will be able to offer others. There's a saying that goes like this. If the biggest sinner you know isn't yourself, then you don't know yourself very well. Paul got it. We spoke of himself in 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 17. Listen to these words. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Some will try to say to you about that passage that Paul is referring to his past sins before he became a Christian. But please note that verse 15 is in the present tense. It doesn't say, I was the worst. He says, Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I what? 
I am the worst. It humbles you, or at least it should, when we reflect on the sins that God has forgiven of us and the sins that we every day he still has to forgive us for and the tremendous grace that he continues to give us day after day after day, it humbles us, or it should. It should humble us. It should mature us when someone, even someone who has hurt you very deeply, and they come to seek your forgiveness. Oh, it should humble us. Yes, we should be going to one another and asking forgiveness and granting forgiveness when it is sought. It's a, the, the true sign of Christian maturity and the true sign that his grace has truly rooted in us is when you can go to somebody and ask for forgiveness or when someone comes to you and you grant forgiveness to others. And to not seek forgiveness is to keep yourself and the persons that have you have hurt in a prison of hurt. And not to forgive when somebody comes to you is to trap yourself even in a prison of bitterness. It's a saying that goes like this. Bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other guy to die. Matthew 6, 14 to 15. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, as in Christ God forgave you. Colossians 3, 13. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In other words, the prisoner that really is set free is you. The key to giving grace is to, is to think about what Jesus has done for you. Is there someone who has hurt you? Pray for them. Lay it all before the throne of God and release them to God's work. Release yourself. You have given them to God. He will deal with it. Until that person comes to you, do not keep yourself in a prison of hurt and bitterness. Take the example of, of our forgiving God. Until we came to him for his forgiveness, he offered his forgiveness and waited for us. He wished no ill on us. He did not plot our revenge. He was poised to grant forgiveness when the time came. We must renounce revenge, give the situation to God to return good for evil. That's our part of forgiveness. And we can do it whether the adversary admits wrong or not. Christ is calling us to a stance, a posture of forgiveness. He's calling us to a readiness to forgive in a moment. He's calling us to treat people with love and mercy, with humility and compassion. He's calling us to remember that if someone has sinned against us, to remember that I have sinned in even greater ways than they have. And God has forgiven me. It's a posture of the heart more the, than an action. It'll, it'll make all the difference in the world the way you think about it, relate to, and pray for the person or give them to God that has offended you. Because one day, that prayer just may circle back. One day, walking in front of you just may be the person that you have given that forgiveness and that hurt to, to God for. One day, that person may stand before you, that same person who hurt you so much, and in your carnal human flesh, you're going to want to strike back at them. But hold on. Remember that you remember your sins before God war and are much greater than anything that person has done to you. Remember how God, the holy and righteous judge God, heard your words of repentance and the grace that he gave you. I'm not saying that it won't hurt you. It will. I'm not saying they, it won't turn you inside out. It will. But for all that you have been forgiven for in your deepest Christian maturity, just as God in Christ forgave you, listen and offer grace to forgive. You can do this. Grace is greater than your hurt. Let it flow. You complete the cycle from when you were released, when you release it as well. Our sins against God. Look at these. See the two things? Grace is in the middle. Grace on the left of that is, yeah, God's grace is greater than our sins against God. Our sins against God. And grace is greater than other sins against us. That's the complete, complete equation. Let me kind of rewrite the ending of the parable. 
as if this is what really God would want. Here's the alternate ending. But when the servant went out that had been forgiven so much, one of his fellow servants who owed him $20 fell to his knees and begged him, be merciful to me. But the hard-hearted servant was now the changed-hearted servant. So like his master, the servant had pity on this servant and said, you know, what you owe me is so tiny compared to the debt that I was just owed and I was forgiven. So I forgive you your debt. Then the master called him in and said, you faithful servant, good for you. You canceled that small debt just as I canceled your massive debt. Change hearted servant, I want to promote you to my chief servant. If the story ended this way, Jesus may have said, this is how my heavenly father will bless each of you who forgive your brother or sister from a heart that has been changed by my grace. Which of the two endings do we want in our lives? It's very simple. Grace given means that we should be grace giving. Say it with me. Grace given means grace giving. One more time. Grace given means grace giving. One more. Grace given means grace giving. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you have forgiven us of so much. Our sins is not just that Jesus had to die for our sins, but it is your grace. Help us to offer that to one another and all others as we try to pass on the grace, the great grace that we have received. In Jesus' name we pray, as all God's people say, amen.